Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to get the buzz on bees from our friend Neil Hunt here on Friends Drift Inn. For old-fashioned recipes and your garden and needs and while sipping on Kentucky bourbon. Sit right back in your big red hat. We're taking the world back from the urban. Listen to the stories with Kentucky proud. Share the giggles with all of your friends. You all are tuned in. Good morning. Welcome to Friends Drift In. I'm Charlie. Joyce a little under the weather. The pollen has got her down. But we've got our buddy Neil Hunt sitting in with us. And Neil, hey. speaking of pollen, you're the bee guy. I'm the bee guy. So Neil's the bee guy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we talk a lot about homesteading and farming and bees are very important for any kind of a homestead, any kind of farmer for the pollination and because they're and and for honey for sweeteners yeah um you know bees are probably one of our most important insects um it said what one third of our food yep um depends upon a honeybee's touch so uh yeah it's a, it's a big deal and uh and springtime is is a is a beekeeper's uh, dream uh lots going on in, in the world of bees right now well, it's swarm season right now uh -huh. here in Kentucky. We know about that as we, we were together last week looking for a swarm. Uh, yeah, beautiful swarm season. Um, and, and I do want to talk a little bit about swarm season. Um, I guess now's a good time. Now's a good time. Uh, so, uh, so most people um, have a, a fear of bees. And, and I'll say, um, don't be scared of bees. Uh, I, I promise they're not all out hunting to sting people. Uh, but uh, it is swarm season. So it's not unusual. Um, for people to find um, large clusters or, uh, as most people say, balls of bees um, hanging in their bushes or the trees, um, around their house, uh, places of business. Uh, truck fenders. Truck fenders. <laughs> <laughs> yes, on your truck. Um, so we, we find them about everywhere. And the most important thing to remember is, is that swarming is, is the way the honeybees reproduce. Um, so it's the honeybees' way of making another colony. So... Um, they're homeless and they're not aggressive and they're not they're not out to sting. Um, they only have one thing on their on their minds when they're swarming, and that is to find a new home. Um, they don't have anything to protect, so they're not going to be trying to protect their home. Um, so if you do encounter a swarm, uh, don't be afraid. Um, and Charlie, who you've seen me, I mean, I dive head first. Oh yeah. <laughs> so but, you know, that's the, the least aggressive time in a bee's life is swarm time. Yep. And it, what you need to do if you see a swarm out there, even if you're if you're afraid of them, that's fine. Call a beekeeper. Yes. Call your local extension that, office. That's what I was going to say. Um, Pike yep. Extension will always get a hold of us. Um, and Pike County Extension Office, can I get there? I guess I can get their phone number. Yep. It's 606-432-2534. Um, and Suzanne is our um, local uh, ag agent, and she is wonderful, um, the best out there. And she will get a hold of, of a beekeeper. Um, it'll probably uh, take us a few minutes to gather our stuff and get there. But it, I mean, Charlie can tell you if you look in my truck right now, I've got everything I need to catch a swarm. And as I catch swarms, I replenish it. So I drive around with it. <laughs> well, you know, this time of year, of course, for a beekeeper, this is great. Technically, you're getting a free yep. hive of bees. Absolutely. But they'll, and that's the thing people don't realize. There's a lot of different ways to get bees. If you want to get into beekeeping, you yeah. can buy a, bo a box of bees or whatever they call a colony. Yeah. And that's probably okay, but if you're a beginning beekeeper, I think you ought to do either buy a whole hive yeah. or a nuclear hive or nukes, uh, yes. we call um, I, I really um, stress uh, to new beekeepers, packages is, is the thing that most people get, and I do not recommend new beekeepers get packages. Uh, a package is basically a wooden box with screen sides and it has about 15,000 bees in it that don't hardly know each other and a queen they don't know. And they ship it out to you and it's a lot of work to get a package started. I mean, there's a lot of things with getting the queen introduced to the hive uh, and getting that colony rolling. Um, it, it's more difficult for a beginner. Um, so if you get a nucleus colony or if you get a swarm even, um, a swarm has already, it, it's ready to roll as far as like it's wanting to build a home and the queen is already accepted. And the queen acceptance is a big thing. And, and that's what's so good about a nuke is that the queen is laying and accepted. 
Um, so you don't have to do that as a beginner trying to get that process to care of. You know, I, I've been, I've done some beekeeping myself. We had a, a couple of yeah. winters. We haven't replenished everything, and I know that you're right. You got to feed them. You got to take care of them. When you get a package of bees, yeah. And and I'm gonna say what? Fifty percent of the time you're gonna lose them. 50, I'd say I'd say at least uh, packages. You'd be lucky if you get fifty percent. I mean, it's not package bees and new beginners have a have a rough start. But a nuclear hive is where somebody's taken an existing hive and divided, them. divided it, put a new queen in it, and they both got queens in them. So those bees are basically already family, as you would yes. call them. Yeah, they're 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 in touch with each other, and there's there's brood, so it's really already starting to grow when you get it. Um, it's a lot easier. You can take that, and there's like most a, a nuclear hive is a half hive, really. It's five it, it's a half five hive. Of, a, of of the ten frames, and you put those five frames in the middle, put five others around it in a new hive and may, you, you know, for good measure, maybe keep them cooped up for a couple days. And, but really you don't have to do that on the No, new. no, you don't, you want them to fly, but you can reduce the entrance um, just to kind of help them get allocated, I guess, but um, they're ready to roll. Uh, when you get them, they're, they're ready to fly. Um, I really suggest too, if you're a new beekeeper, if you're interested in beekeeping, uh, the first thing I want to tell you is to come to your local beekeepers organization. I got to plug the uh, Pike County Beekeeper Association. Uh, we are a, a very um, large group, actually. We have usually got at least um, 50. Or oh, uh, at least. At least. At a meeting. And we've know. had up to 100 um, at our meetings. So uh, over, we've had over 100, actually, once or twice. So we're, we're a large group, and it ranges from brand new beekeepers to people just want to know more about bees. All the way up to people that are um, seasoned, and uh, they're they're uh, they're really good mentors. And so, be, join a beekeeping organization if you're interested in beekeeping. Um, Pike County beekeepers meet first Monday of every month at six o'clock at the extension office, um, and it's rare that we don't make a Monday. Yeah, other than uh, something strange happening like the COVID, COVID situation, yeah. But you know, there, and there's beekeep should be a beekeeping club in just about every county in Kentucky yeah. or anywhere you are in the country. There's beekeepers. Yes. And if you can't find a beekeepers club, find a local beekeeper because most beekeepers are a tight community and they really <laughs> want to help each other. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, when we, my wife may, gives me a hard time, but I'll, I'll just tell you, we like to talk about bees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We. Uh, uh, we seen on Facebook there, uh, there was a lady had a jar on there and it said, uh, it's like a swear jar, but it said, I talked about bees without being asked. <laughs> and so I think I'm going to have one of those. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> but you know, the thing, the thing too about it, each state also has like a, a head beekeeper or yep. uh, what, what, what is the word? I've state apiarist. Uh, state apiarist. Um, we're very we're blessed. fortunate. Yes, yeah. we are. <laughs> we're very, very blessed, very fortunate um, that Kentucky State Apiarist is Tammy Horn. And Tammy is outstanding. She's a fr personal friend of mine, Neil's and yes. I as well. We're and Joyce, we're, we've been. She's been at our house, and but she's the most active apiarist we've had. She, you call her, and she will get back to you. She will come to you yes. if you need her. She's she's wonderful. Um, I, uh, she, I was really excited when Tammy got that position, and uh, uh, it, she does her state of credit. She does. You know, Tammy uh, uh, was an educator before that. She she's done. All she's, kinds of things with oh, yeah. bees. She's, Real books. She's got. I remember maybe we'll put, drop a couple links in here later <laughs> of the three books that she's written. Of course, it's now Tammy Horn Potter. I guess we got to get the correct <laughs> that's, name that's in true. there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Doug. <laughs> yeah, we, we, didn't mean, we didn't mean to cut you out. You know, we've just known Tammy a long time. Um, I will say that uh, you know, I've joined um, the Kentucky Queen Breeder Association, so I. Uh, me and my buddy Tony, we do a lot with raising queens. And uh, Tammy was actually the person that uh, helped teach me how to grab bees, queens. Well, you know, Tammy, Tammy's had some great experience. Yeah. She spent some time in Hawaii uh, breeding yep. queens over there, learning how to do that. Yep. She's uh, she's done a lot of beekeeping experiments on buildings in the cities, uh, on co uh, strip jobs here Big in Eastern Kentucky. Big time strip jobs, yes, she is. And um, a lot of places when you go and you're driving, even not even just in Kentucky, but other states, and you see these big pollinator fields, you can almost guarantee that she had a hand in that. And that's something else we talk about, pollinator fields. That's one of the problems with bees now, is you need to find you a space and, and put something out for the bees that they can get to without any sprays or anything, because agricultural spraying is really hard on the bee population. It stresses them. I mean, if it's done correctly, it's manageable, but I mean, anytime, 
you're, you live in a, a big ag area, um, monocrop cultural place, you're going to end up with some issues with spraying. Um, Tammy, back to Tammy, has uh, yeah. worked really hard. And there's like uh, there's an app on your phone that you can get that um, farmers and beekeepers work together um, to let each other know when they're going to be spraying. And that's uh, it's been very successful with the groups that's used it. You know, I've taken the uh, spray course, so, so I'm yeah. licensed to be able to spray out there too. No other things they tell you in that is, you know, first notify your beekeepers when you're going to spray and what you're going to spray. Yep. And if you'll spray like an hour before dust, yep. the bees are already heading home by that time. And timing, timing is timing everything. is everything. If you find out what time is the right time, talk to a local beekeeper. They can tell you what time bees will come back to the hive at night because they, bees don't fly around at night. No. If you get right down in the late evening and do your spraying, or maybe even in the early morning, but really, evening is even best because it dries yeah. overnight, yeah. and if it's dry, the bee it doesn't affect the bees as much. Um, and and this is a big thing in our area, and I hope I don't offend anybody. Follow the labeling on your sprays. <laughs> Just because you know somebody that gave it three times the amount and had luck with it, you follow the labeling on your sprays. Well, anything y'all bear me. If you're spraying crops, or you're you know you could be hurting other things like your pets or anything else. If yeah. You know, too. Uh, but really, a bee colony, in especially if you're in an uh, area that's a lot of agriculture around. You can actually, a lot of places they'll either rent you bees or they'll just bring their bees yeah, to you. Absolutely. Um, it's not as not as needed in this area. Right. Although we do get calls about pollinator contracts. Right. Uh, but you, know, you look at, uh, you know, everybody talks about the biggest ones, the almonds out in California in February. It's like two and a half million beehives in, in California or something like that in February. It's ridiculous uh, how many bees it takes to pollinate almonds. It's a billion dollar industry. Tammy told me one time about the, uh, they call them the last cowboys. That's the migrant beekeepers. Yeah. And they've got tractors and trailers. They've got forklifts. They put, they put their bees out on pallets. Yep. And they'll come and unload them and set them up. But they, and they travel only at night, so you never see them because they wait till the yep. bees come back in. And, and they follow the bloom. They'll go to where, like it's Florida. Always, it's always yeah. the almonds first. Yeah, it's almonds out <laughs> in California first. Then they'll go, then they've got the citrus in Florida, yeah. citrus the in California, the apples, blueberries. I mean, they go all yeah. around the country and, and they live out of those trucks and they, they, they consider themselves the last cowboys in the country. And I, I can believe that. I mean, um, I know a lot of, a lot of migratory beekeepers. Um, I know uh, Rick Sutton, and his son Brandon, I met. Yeah. They've got several thousand hives, and they travel and, and work those bees. It's it's a it's a big job. It's really amazing what they do. I think you know, and beekeeping. You know, one of the things you got to look at too is we've got a thing out there called colony collapse disorder, and I don't think anybody really knows exactly what it is, but. You know, you always need to have at least two or three hives yeah. because you're going you're going to lose some eventually. Unfortunately, it's common to lose bees. I mean, it, it hurts when it happens. Yes. Um, and it, it never gets easy to lose a bee colony. But as a as a new beekeeper, I suggest everybody get at least two hives. Two hives gives you a comparison. If you've got one that's doing very well and you got one that's doing extremely well, it gives you an idea. Of maybe this one didn't do as good as you thought. Um, it also gives you resources. Um, if you lose a hive, you can split a hive. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you need genetics as far as, or brood, you, it gives you resources you don't have with just one hive. Um, so I always suggest two. Um, you know, I told uh, my wife, I said, I'm going to get 20 hives, so I, I've got 60. So, <laughs> so um, but um, it's addictive. It is. But yeah. always, I always suggest that as a new beekeeper, you start out with no less than two hives. Um, and, and, and go from there. There's like a lot of things you need to learn. You know, there's some equipment you need. Really, the first time you want to be a keeper, if you get a, a, like just a jacket, yeah. a veil, and a pair of gloves. Yeah, a smoker. A smoker. Hive tool. Hive tool. Well, that, you can get by with that. The, the biggest thing, too, and I, and I tell a lot of new beekeepers this, is don't get overwhelmed in the catalogs. Uh, because it's like a Christmas catalog oh, it is, for yeah. me. Oh, I uh, agree. As a seasoned beekeeper, I want everything in there. But as a new beekeeper, you don't need to go that big that quick. Uh, you need to get the basic hive, uh, standard, you know, 10-frame hive, if that's what you choose to do. 
uh, and then get the basic equipment and get used to having bees and then build yourself into some of the more complicated things. And don't get overwhelmed because it, it it's expensive to start. It, it is. I mean, it's, to get started, it's expensive, it, but if you buy like two hives and just enough tools to get by with until you learn what you're doing. It's, um, you're probably looking at, to get started in beekeeping, 500 bucks right now. I think you're right. By the time you buy your tools and, and two your hives bees, and your yeah, bees. And your equipment. And you can get, um, I guess I'm going to plug somebody. That's right. Um, Jim Koss from the Honey and Bee Connection in Moorhead. Um, he's a good friend of mine, and he's got a, a really good supply of beekeeping needs. And he'll sit and talk to you about it and show you what you need and tell you what you don't need. He's, he's, he's pretty he's pretty good because um, he's also a beekeeper. And so and they sell kits that come with um, everything you need from your, your jacket to your hive tool, your smoker, and, and a hive. So you can buy that as a kit. Yeah. And, and that's what I usually suggest. I also suggest that you read. Um, and I love to read beekeeping books. I've got a stack of them. But as a new beekeeper, um, you, you're you gonna have to get used to, one, what terms are beekeeping the user, beekeepers are using. It's a different vocabulary. It is. Um, and so there's a lot of good books that, that go over just basic vocabulary and basic beekeeping to get you started. Uh, Beekeepers for Dummies is great. Um, my personal favorite um, is A Year in the Life of an Apiary with um, Keith Dillon playing from out of Georgia. And that, that, it's got a book and a video that go together and it's outstanding. So, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. I still read that book and I've been beekeeping 18 years. We'll try to drop some links in. I'll get him to remind me of those, and I'll drop some links in there for the what books that you'd be interested yeah. in. Of course, Tammy's books, I've got some links in there for hers already. Uh, let's talk a little bit about people don't understand. Like, bees are a very different insect, you know, because... They're eusocial. Yeah. Now, they're one, of, they're one of the few eusocial insects, which means that every every bee in their hive works for the greater good of the hive and not their self. Um, it, it's remarkable that... They all function as one. Actually, it's been said that the entire colony of 60,000 bees function as one brain. And the queen bee and the yeah. head of that <laughs> colony. Yeah, there's a, a queen bee. Um, she's the mother of the colony. She will the colony. They really pollinate cucumbers. Um, if, and, I, and I've had a lot of people ask me this. You know, why are my cucumbers big on one end and little on the other? That's generally poor pollination. So, um, that, that fruit from on that cucumber or anything um, didn't squash, um, and I know a big one we talk about is watermelon. Yep, um, just talking about those. Uh, you know, if you get a big end and a little end, it's almost always pollination issues. Yeah, and you know, that's the thing about it. You know, you don't have to have bees yourself. Your neighbors can have bees, yeah. but you know, another thing too about bees is you get the, the great bonus of honey. Yeah, which, uh, it sells so quick. I don't really keep any for myself. Everybody always talks to me about it. I, but now last year I did keep a pound of honey. And, and, and the year before that I kept a pound. So that's probably the only two pounds of honey I've kept for myself in 17 years. <laughs> but, and, and, and I love it. Yeah, honey's really great too. Like Joyce needs to be having more of her honey because of her allergies to yeah. this year. You know, uh, the thing about it, and you get local honey, which is good for you to help combat allergies and everything, try to build you up a tolerance to you know, the pollen. And, you know, honey is, has even been used as antiseptic and everything. I mean, honey is, is a preservative. People have preserved fruits in honey. Um, I've got a friend that makes mead. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try my hand at that. Uh, you know, there's cream honeys. My personal favorite honey is just honey on toast with peanut butter. It's delicious. And banana. Yeah. Well, yeah. I take I take my hot biscuits, cut them half, a little butter or cornbread. I love corn, <laughs> I, don't like cornbread I love cornbread, and, <laughs> cornbread and honey. Those are one of my desserts. You know, that's something you, you know. This is so good. It's good yeah. for you. Honey, like you said, honey is good for a lot of things. You got a sore, you put rub a little honey on it. Yeah. Honey's got a natural antiseptic. Plus, it keeps the oxygen out of it. Yeah. They found honey from in the pyramids yep. that's still viable. Yeah, it, it's it's a perfect. Uh, it's, it's done perfectly. The bees really know what they're doing when they make honey. Um, you know, the, they bring back the nectar, which is almost entirely water, and they they evaporate and dehydrate the, the water out of the nectar, and it makes the honey. 
And once it reaches a certain moisture content, they, they seal it up with wax to keep moisture out of it. So when it's sealed up and ready to go, and if you get it at the right moisture content, I mean, it'll keep for years. But a disclaimer, all honey will granulate. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's sugar. Put it in boiling water, yeah. don't it recomp? Absolutely. Recomp, so uh, right back. Put, don't put the jar, it. put the jar in <laughs> boiling water, I should say. Don't, don't overheat it. Don't but, you overheat know. it. And, and I know a lot of people say, well, I put mine in the microwave. Don't put your honey in the microwave. If you take the time to find local honey that you were using, if you put it in the microwave and you don't, you can't control the temperature, then you're killing everything. You just made a sweetener out of it. Yeah. You're not going to get any of the benefits from the from the honey. Uh, and that's the thing about buying honey in stores is that it's all been pasteurized. There's nothing. There's the health benefits are lost through that process. Which is why you find a local. It's why you find a local beekeeper that you can trust and that you can develop a relationship with. Go to your farmers markets. Find your beekeeper associations and get the honey from people that, that know what they're doing. And, and if you do have granulated honey, you just take a kettle of water and put you a, um, a dishcloth on the bottom of it, turn it on, get it good and warm, turn it off the heat, set the honey in it, and just keep repeating that process until it liquefies and it don't take that long. No, it's not long at all. Yeah, and a lot of people think that if you get granulated honey, it's because they've been fed sugar, but yes. that's not true. No. All, you know, all honey is sugar. It's, all honey. You know, it's just it's a, a and all honeys granulate differently. Yeah. Um, I know if you if you're ever in Pike County, I don't know most people um, around here want Lynn honey, but Lynn honey has got a high sugar content. It granulates um, pretty quickly. You know there are some honeys, especially in Hawaii, that granulate in the comb. They're that high sugar content. Um, typically, the darker honeys don't granulate as quick, um, and they're typically not as sweet. But they're my favorite. You get a lot more depth of flavor sometimes. Yeah. I love Lynn honey, yeah. but I also love a sour wood and all yeah. that well, too. The two popper is my favorite. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the flavors in honey are just incredible. I mean, it's it's remarkable what you can, the difference in the seasons for honey. Well, that's true. I was going to say, and that's what honey is. Like the early honeys are usually lighter and it gets darker as time goes on because you get the mix as time goes yeah. on. Now with me, you know, Honey is probably my least favorite thing as far as the work of the bees because yeah. it it's brute work. The boxes are heavy, the season is hot, and the work is long. But it's a pretty good feeling too knowing that your bees accomplished uh, that and it, you you had a part in it. And if you do it right, it's a good way to help offset your cost of beekeeping. It, it I mean, is. You're not going to make a lot of money on honey unless you've got a lot of bees. <laughs> I, you, I don't make no money in beekeeping. Well, <laughs> but I do, I do, like you said, it does help offset the cost of my habit. You know, if you ever become a beekeeper, always remember when you're robbing, taking your honey or robbing the bees, as we call it here, leave some for the bees. Yeah. Don't, don't take everything because it's not worth the money you're going to get out of leaving that, that taking that extra super. You will pay the price. Need. Yes. You're, you're either going to have to let them have that honey to live on, which is probably better for them. Yep. Or you're going to have to feed them all winter and then you're going to lose, and you'll lose a lot more of them when you have to, have to feed them instead of let them live off yep. their own honey. Um, a honeybee colony will, will consume in this area somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds of honey sugar water in the winter. In just a winter. Yeah, and got and remember that the big box is the brood box that is mostly mostly brewed for raising more bees. There's a little honey in there yeah. for them to eat off of, but the honey comes out of what we call the supers that we attach on yes. the top. Yes, yeah. Never rob honey from your brood boxes. No. Never, never, ever, ever. And, and I, I see that a lot. Um, believe it or not. I, when I when I had my bees, I would leave one super yeah. for the bees, and that's and a really good box. idea in this area because super honey, uh, with what's in the brood box, is about what it takes to get a hive through winter. Um, I do winter a lot of single deeps or single brood boxes, but on those hives, you know, I do supplement feed during the winter. So, well, Neil, thank you for talking. Oh, with us. I love my bees. Well, we appreciate so, it. Uh, well, if you see a swarm of bees, call the extension office. Call the extension. <laughs> yeah. If you're in Pike County, call me if you see my number and I'll get a hold of Neil. We, we, we do this a lot. But remember everybody, please like and subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the more chance we're going to get to do live. We get enough subscribers, we're going to start doing some lives. And that'd be what we enjoy. Well, you can talk to us at the time. If you got any comments, anything that you would like to see us do, let us know. 
Hey, you can check out our jams and jellies at www.friendsdriftin. They're good. All right. <laughs> For Neil Hunt, this is Charlie Pinson. We'll see you next week on Friends Drift In.